you, Saba. So um, we will begin our song for today's worship. It's AZH109, and I feel that you guys. Sin and despair like the sea waves go, shreds in the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace that is more, points to the refuge and mighty cross. Grace Infinite, much less grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see His face, for you this moment is grace received. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace. You can sit. Good morning, church. It is nice to be here today. I was also in the arena today. There is a lot of young people there, and they have their worship. We are here, so God's name has is worship today. So that's great to see. And uh, as we sing, marvelous grace of our loving Lord, we are aware that our God is loving and that He is gracious. Um, and today we are gathered around the same goal, to worship our God. We have our brother John today with us, who will share a word of God with the title, let me just check, Will Your Anchor Hold? We will see what it is about. I also want to thank a music team for being here with us, with Daniel, Vida, Moses, and Nang. Thank you for serving us and Lord. I also want to thank a technique team behind for making sure that we've been heard here and seen also here but on YouTube. Um, our God is powerful, right? He is, as a matter of fact, He is so mighty and great 
that it is hard to explain it in our human terms. So in order for us to explain how God powerful is and how mighty he is, we may use many different illustrations or kind of, for example, we say that God is shepherd. He takes care of us. He is also a lamb because he gave his life for us. He is a good father. Can you think of some more? You don't have to say, you can say it if you, but we use different names of God also. We say he is Yahweh, he is Elohim, he is Emmanuel, and so many more just to try to explain just a little bit of the nature of God. In the next song that we are going to sing, there are some few more. I will say that the Lord is our rock, in him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm, cooling shade on the burning sand, faithful guide for the pilgrim band. So we will sing now a two, uh, two more songs, and I invite music team to lead us in singing. So we continue with him 517. 517.
do you know what is the only way to worry about nothing? It is to pray about everything. Um, now is the time that we use in our service for prayer. And prayer is essential. I like how Ellen G. White puts it. She says, it is the prayer. It is not about bringing God closer to us, but about lifting us closer to God. And this morning, I would like to do a special prayer activity. We'll call it five fingers of prayer, and it is easy to remember. And each time you pray, think about different group of people. And so with each finger, I will explain what it means. Five fingers of prayer. Um, if you have children, this is quite interesting for them. Um, and when you pray, I don't want to tell you if you are going to form two groups of two or three or you want to pray alone, it's up to you. Um, you can do both. Um, but yeah, so let, let us go to what five fingers represent. I can just put my, my text here so I don't forget. But it's quite easy. So uh, we start with a thumb. A thumb is finger that is closest to our heart. So we, play, uh, so we pray for people who are closest to us, our friends, our family. Okay? Then we have a pointer finger. Pointer finger is used to uh, give directions. So we pray for teachers, coaches, doctors. Okay? Third finger, middle finger, it's the tallest. So pray for leaders in the church, for leaders in government. The ring finger is the weakest, so we pray also for the, for the sick, for the poor, and for the weakest, so who, those who are in the most need. And five, the pinky finger <laughs> is the smallest, so also pray for yourself. Okay? It's easy to remember? So this is the closest to your heart, so pray, pray for family and friends. Pointer finger for those who give directions, so yeah teachers, so for the middle finger, for those who are the tallest, so our leaders in the, in the churches and in the government, weakest finger is for the poor, for the sick, and the smallest finger is for yourself. So we can use also five minutes of five fingers of prayer. <laughs>
Now we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this moment as we remember and pray for the people around us. Thank you for listening our prayers and we put our trust into your hands. Amen. There are some announcements. Um, so this month, on 18th of June, uh, there, there's going to be a worship service for the end of semester. And after this service, um, we will have a potluck at 1.30 outside the Stutz. Okay, so we will gather together, bring some food, and spend some time in a, in a, in a fellowship. And of course, enjoying some food. So we can also pray for good weather, and we're going to have a good time. Um, so this is for 18th of June. So mark this in your schedule and see us there. Um, the second announcement, I would like to invite Pastor Stefan to share this with us. Good morning and happy Sabbath. A week later, on the 25th of June, we have a special Sabbath here in Friedensau. We have a conference-wide Sabbath together in the arena. We have about a thousand people who have registered so far for this. It's a very e exciting event to look forward to, to have members from all over our conference, and our conference is fairly large, come together here to worship together. We are part of the conference, and so the invitation is also for us. Now, you will have to stress your, the German part of your brain or Google Translate to read this flyer, which is here in a little box or outside on the on the round table, it contains information. I would like to also point out that we have to register for the event. Uh, there's a website, www.wirsindbmv.de. That's weird, English, German, Eng anyway. And um, if you are hesitant, then you can do the analog way and write your name on this sign-up sheet, which I will also put out there on the round table. Uh, just put your name, put an X if you want to come to the Gottesdienst, to the church service in the morning, put an X or minus if you do or don't want to get a meal ticket, which costs five euro, and put an X if you want to also attend the concert with a renowned German um, gospel artist, uh, Pepper, what's his first name? Wie heißt denn der Pepper mit Vornamen? Naja, der jedenfalls. It's that one. Anyway, so if you want to come to the concert, then tick here as well, and I'll put that out there. Now, with the invitation came this. Each church in our conference received a blanket. And we got a nice red one, which is cool because it's Pentecost, this weekend, and uh, in the Lutheran church, red is the color for Pentecost. So that's fit. It's a symbolic blanket because we can't all fit on it, but we want to create the largest conference picnic blanket we've ever had at the um, Zeltplatz on the 25th of June. So um, if you find that this one has already been taken by other church members, then feel free to bring your own and add to the size of our picnic blanket. Thank you very much. May God bless you this Sabbath. Thank you. So now we will have a music team leading us again in the, in the singing. After this, uh, I, I will invite Kwame to read the Bible, Bible verse. Yes? Okay. 
And then uh, Brother John will have a word of God with us. Please, shall we be on our feet and we take SGH 500, 500. Please, let, let us be on our feet.
Thank you very much, Bikandi. Please be seated. Let's take our Bibles and open with me into Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 19. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 through 19. I read. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. May the good Lord bless us. Amen. At this point in time, I invite Brother John to come for a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Master and Savior, our Lord and our hope, we are most grateful to you for yet another Sabbath that we being sinners, I've been invited by you to come before thee to serve thee. We've come in our sinful manner. We plead that you wash us in the blood of Jesus. Your son, we're going to use him to reach us. We pray that the message that you've prepared for us today, we will understand and put into practice. Bless us. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Is it working, Gabriel? Okay, great. I want to welcome everyone who has come today. God is in our midst, and that is our assurance. And for those who are joining from your homes, we also welcome you, and we pray that God's blessings will be made manifest in our lives. I don't always like asking who is happy in the presence of God. I believe everyone who has come should be grateful. So I believe you are happy and grateful. I don't want to ask you, but I hope you are, right? All right. Today I want to talk about storms. Coincidentally, one of the songs that have been sung today talked about storms. But I want to say that storms are not harmless. Let me give you a few statistics about storms. According to the International Disaster Database, Bangladesh has endured two of the world's worst storms. Did you know about that? In 1970 and 1991. In 1970, there were about 300,000 reported deaths in Bangladesh just by storms. And then in 1991, there were about 138,866 deaths you know, caused by storms. And if you go back in their history, in 1942, they lost 61,000. In 1963 and 65 combined, they lost 58,000. So these were people who died as a result of storms. And of course, in, in the recent past, in 2008, in Myanmar, those who are from there, there was a terrible storm and about 138,366 people died you know, from that storm. So storms are capable of destroying lives and other things. And just to say, preparations for storms are done before the storms come. Today I'm talking about a different kind of storm, and I would like you to open your Bible with me to Mark chapter 4. And I'll read from verse 35. Mark chapter 4. Would you please open your Bible with me? Mark chapter 4. I want to see everybody opening their Bibles, electronic, 
anyone you have. The Bible says, on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, that's Jesus, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Where, Why are you fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? My message is a question. Will your anchor hold in the storm of life? Would you pray with me? Oh, master, the tempest is raging. The billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness. It seems no shelter or help is nigh. But don't you care that we perish? How can you lie asleep when each moment so madly is threatening? Father, the winds and the waves still obey your will. Would you please speak peace and let our troubled lives be still? Amen. So, church, the effects of storms are huge. You know, when storms come, people are injured. People are killed because debris fly around. And anything in the way of the storm is endangered. And sometimes the, the storms come with heavy rain and people drown. And other things that help us in life are cut off, like, like electricity. Even the water we drink become becomes contaminated because there is a storm. And you know, the response, the human response to storms is always escape. So what do you do when storms come? People are rescued. And for those who were prepared before the storms come, they escape. So human response to storms is always escape. So some are rescued while others die in the storm. So we can learn from this physical storm, but I will announce to you that a storm in the life of a Christian is a different kind of storm. It is called the cosmic storm for want of the right expression. And unlike the physical storm we experience in life, where people are rescued, where people escape, this cosmic storm is a necessary storm. It is a storm that is inevitable. Everyone has to go through it. And the Christian has a simple goal. That goal is to emerge from the storm alive. I don't want to lose my audience. Think about the physical storm, the tropical storms. Think about the devastation it can bring. And now think about the storms in the life of a Christian. And today's message is saying that unlike the physical storm where people are rescued, the storms in a Christian's life are necessary. They are storms that we must endure. But the goal is to come through the storms 
alive. And that's why the sermon is entitled, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storm of Life? Now, the Christian race is a serious race. It is not a race for those who are lily-hearted. It is a race for those who are courageous. But I want to promise you that the race is already won. Amen. Like I always say, we don't pay to say amen in this church, right? The Christian race is already a victorious race because Jesus has overcome already and his victory is for you and for me. Now, I would like to summarize my sermon in two fine points before I even proceed to preach it. So this is a summary. If you, if you lose me or if I lose you in the sermon, these two points are the points you can go home with, right? Point number one, God has a plan to save us. And he wants to save us through this cosmic storm. Amen. And this summary is based on Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The Bible says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Point number two, Jesus is the anchor. Will your anchor hold in the storm of life? Jesus is the anchor. I thought someone who loved Jesus would say amen to that. Jesus is the anchor, and he will steer our boat safely to the peaceful shore. So already, you can see the summary of today's sermon. And this second summary is based on the text we were read, I mean, that was read for us from Hebrews chapter 6, Verse 18 through 19, we have Jesus as the anchor of the soul. And this anchor is sure and steadfast. You know, we have this song we sing, will your anchor hold in the time of storm, right? We have an anchor that keeps the soul. He keeps the soul steadfast and sure. While the billows roll, fasten to the rock. Who is that rock? Jesus, the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. So this is the summary of today's sermon, in case you want to have it. Church, we are in the eye of the storm. With what we see around us today, even the blind can see and the deaf can hear that we are in the eye of the storm. We live in a world with many paradoxes. A paradox is a contradiction. Our world is a world full of contradictions. In our world today, we have more doctors and medications, yet we have more diseases than ever before. That's a contradiction, isn't it? In our world today, we have more food than ever before, yet we have more people starving in the world. That's a contradiction. In our world today, we have many fanciful houses, yet we have many broken homes living in those houses. This is a world of contradiction. And for the young people, we have many happy faces on social media. Yet, behind those faces are real sad people. That's a contradiction. In our world today, we have more peace meetings. Peace talks everywhere, yet we have more conflict and more wars. Think about it, that we have more prisons than ever before in the world, yet we have more prisoners than we have ever had. Our world is 
a word of contradiction. Today, people run to outer space. Yet, they find it difficult to say hi to their closest neighbor. This is a word of contradiction. And just to talk about the recent happenings, did you know that now in America, we have more guns than those who actually own those guns? And of course, you know that in the, pa in the recent past, we've had many cases of mass shootings in America. This is June, the sixth month of the year. So we have six more months to go. And let me announce to you that already we have had two, three, three mass shootings in America just in the first six months of the year. Not a single week in this year has passed without at least four mass shootings in America. It is real. Guns everywhere. Guns everywhere. Just the other day on May 14, there was a racist attack somewhere in Buffalo, New York, where a young man of 18 gunned down 10 African Americans. And you know, he live streamed the shooting. He was live on Facebook or so. And, and most of those who were killed were seniors, old people in their 80s. This is the reality of the world we live in. And just 10 days after that, another 18-year-old guy went to an elementary school in Texas and killed 21 people. 19 of those who were killed were just kids in classroom. Kids below 10 years, and they were killed. So friends, this is the reality of the world we live in. And just two days ago, two days ago, somewhere in Oklahoma, a gunman opened fire on a medical facility. What was his problem? A doctor treated him, and he was having this pain after the surgery. And he came back and opened fire at the hospital, killing the doctor and three other persons. This is a crazy world we find ourselves in. But you know, America does not have a monopoly of violence. It's everywhere in the world. It's everywhere in the world. Terrorism, banditry. You know, I come from Nigeria. And in the northern part of Nigeria, people are kidnapped every day. Travelers, children, they're kidnapped for ransom. These things are there. And you can attest that our world is becoming unsafe by the day. And, and I, I pause to think sometimes that it seems to me that wild animals have found a way to live peacefully with themselves than human beings. It seems to be. Because we don't know how to get along. We kill ourselves. It is about 100 days since Ukraine was attacked. Houses are being destroyed, shellings every day, missiles every day. It seems to me that humans don't just know how to get along, that even wild animals seem to know how to get along more than ourselves. So friends, this is where we are in our time. But stay with me. We are also told that we are approaching a very serious economic crisis. That's what we're told. In the UK, people have been told that perhaps in the coming winter, they may have to choose between heating or eating. Did you hear that? Because of the high 
you know, the, the price of, of energy, right? They may have to choose between heating or eating, driving or eating. And of course, in the U.S., we also heard about this scarcity of baby formula, food for babies, nowhere to be found. This is a reality of the times we live in. And as if we are safe, no, it is here with us, even in this beautiful country called Germany. You may have heard that the, the government is trying to subsidize the cost of energy, right? Some of you are already enjoy, enjoying the nine euros uh, stock, right? It is part of the realities of the time. The government is saying, we want you to spend less driving your cars just as a way of you know, facing the realities of our times. Just this week, some African leaders went to meet Mr. Putin in Moscow. What was their, what was their, their concern? They told him that the war in, in the Ukraine is about to cause a food crisis in Africa. There's a looming food crisis in Africa. And I was wondering what it would be like. But friends, that is the end of the, of, the, of the grim picture I want to paint this morning. Henceforth in my sermon, I want to intentionally move away from all these troubles in our world. I want to courageously look away from the chaos in our world to a glorious future. I am looking away from the carnage in the world to a future without wars. And that's the reason for this message. If you want to hear all the evils in the world, just tune, tune into your radio or put on your TV. There is no good news anywhere. My work today is to encourage you in the Lord and not to frighten you with all the bad news around. I am looking away from the hunger and starvation in South Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Somalia, to a future where there shall be no more hunger or thirst. Someone should say amen to that. I am looking away from all the terrorism around us. You know, there are those right away who are in kidnappers' dens. They don't have their freedom again. But I'm looking away from that to a time when we shall be truly free. There is a country that calls itself the land of the, of the free. But the question is, are they truly free? But I am looking away from all the things that imprison us in life to a time when we shall be truly free in God. I am looking away from COVID-19. I'm looking away from, from monkeypox to a time when there shall be no diseases and pandemics. I am looking away from the nuclear weapons, from the missiles, from the war tanks, from the shellings, to a time when there shall be no more war, when there shall be peace forever with the Lord. I am looking away from rapes, from refugees, from discrimination, from racism, from tribalism, from human trafficking, from sex slavery. All these are the realities of our time. But I choose to look away from them because the Bible says, God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the old things shall pass away. Amen. Amen. Behold, the Bible says, God will make all things new. Now, this is the plan I told you in my summary. God's plan is to make all things new. That's the plan. God is going to have the final say 
in the events of the world. He's going to make all things new. It is part of his plan for you and for me. So friends, let me announce to you that there is someone who is behind all the storms that come to us in life. He is the enemy of God. His name is Satan. And this cosmic storm is a conflict between God and Satan, between good and bad, between light and darkness. And we are the objects of this conflict. But praise God, God will have the final say. Amen. He will have the final say. Because Satan has been unmasked. He was unmasked at the cross. At the cross, he was defeated forever. At the cross, Jesus signed our emancipation papers. At the cross, you and I were saved forever. So we can go through the storm confidently, believing that Jesus will see us through. I want to assure you that even in your life, God will have the final say. You don't believe it. I don't know where you are at the moment, but if you trust in Jesus, who is the anchor, God will have the final say over your health. God will have the final say over your education. God will have the final say even in your marriage. It doesn't matter where you are today. God will surely have the final say. Will your anchor hold in the storm of life? I want to start concluding this message today. But I want us to go back to Mark chapter 8, verse 35. There are some very important lessons we have to go home with today. Would you open your Bible again to Mark chapter 8 from verse 35? We are talking about storms today. And Jesus taught the disciples a lesson of faith in the story we read in Mark chapter 8. The Bible says that after a very tiring day of preaching and teaching for Jesus, he and his disciples went into a boat to cross the Galilean Sea. And you know, as they were going, there were other sheep, there were other boats. But the disciples were in the boat of Jesus. Pay attention to all, po all the pointers uh, you can find in this story today. The evening had been calm and very pleasant. But then as they were going, there was a sudden break in the tranquility of the night. The Bible says that a storm came. And the winds dashed over their boat. Remember I told you that behind every storm is the enemy of God. And you can imagine on this very cool evening, even with Jesus on the boat, the enemy of God was at hand to bring storm to that boat that day. But the Bible says that the boat was filling with water. The boat was going down. So the disciples were afraid. There was commotion and confusion. But you know, these guys were actually experienced sailors. They were mainly fishermen before Jesus called them. So when the, when the crisis began... They tried all they could in their strength, I would think. They tried all they could with their expertise as sellers. You know, in the past, they must have maneuvered many storms. And at this time, they also felt it was something they could do. But as they tried all they could, they realized it was a different storm. That came upon them. You know, there comes a time in our lives when even all that we know can no longer help us. There comes a time in our lives when our wealth 
when our education fell us. And that was the experience they had on that day. So the storm was, was so much that they were losing their lives. But pay attention to what's happened in that text. They were so absorbed in their effort to save themselves that they forgot that Jesus was with them. Are you with me? Are you with me, church? I don't want to lose you. They were so absorbed in the efforts to save themselves that they forgot that Jesus was in that boat. How many times do we forget that Jesus is in the boat of our life? As Christians, how many times do you forget that there is a God who is with you all through the way? So when they could not save themselves, when all their efforts fell them, they remembered Jesus. I'm just praying for you that uh, you and I, and I'm praying for myself too, that we will not remember Jesus when it is too late. You know, for some people, Jesus is their, is their first option, right? But for some others, he is their last resort. So on this day, Jesus was the last resort of the disciples. But you know what happened in that story? When they found Jesus, what was he doing? Church, what was he doing? Jesus was sleeping. And you know, sometimes when you read the Bible, you are, you are asking yourself, how can it be that with the noise of the storm and the winds, Jesus was sleeping? Well, I believe the Bible. I don't want to doubt the Bible. But I believe there is a lesson that Jesus was going to teach them in that story. So even as the boat was filling with water, Jesus was sleeping. And the Bible adds that he was even sleeping on a pillow. How can that be? But then they called on Jesus. Don't you care that we perish? They called on him. They prayed to him. And Jesus answered them. He stood up in their midst with his hands lifted. Jesus rebuked the wind. And he said, peace be still. Amen. The wind ceased. The billows were gone. The clouds rolled away. There was calm. And if you were there, perhaps you would have seen that the disciples actually became afraid. But not of the storm now. They were now more afraid of the calm than the storm. And they asked, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey his will? But Jesus asked them a very important question. And that is what he's asking us today. He asked them, where is your faith? And church, even as we pass through the storms of life, God is reminding us today that we should not lose our faith. But now think about it. I, I want us to just speak a few lessons there. Number one, Jesus did not ask them, what is your faith? It was not time for theology. It was time for action, right? You know, stormy times are not times for debate. They're not time for theology. They are time for action. They are times for action. And because we cannot prepare for the storms in the storm, we need to prepare ahead of the storm. And friends, because there are stormy days ahead of us, now is the time to build the faith we need to overcome the storm. Jesus asked them, where is your faith? Your faith has to be in Jesus, friends. That's the message. Storms will come in our lives. But the difference will be, where will your faith be 
when Jesus, when the storms come, and now think about it, you know, when they were on, on, on land, perhaps their faith was in Jesus, right? Because Jesus was always walking around. They believed in him when they were on land. But now, when they were at sea, they believed in themselves because they were sailors. And that's why Jesus asked them, I believe, where is your faith? And today, God is asking you, where is your faith? Is your faith in Jesus? Or is your faith in something else? Lesson number one, it was in the evening. Have you ever traveled, I mean, at night? Of course, in some places, it's okay to travel at night. But here, they were traveling at night and they were at sea. Of course, it's, it must have been double tragedy when the storms came. So there was darkness and it was stormy. In some people's lives today, it is just that way. They, they are exiting one trouble and as they are exiting that trouble, they are moving right into another one. But God has a message for you today. The Bible says in Psalms 30 verse 5, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes when? In the morning. So as a Christian, no matter what you are going through, joy will come in the morning for you. Remember when they were beginning the journey, Jesus told them, let us pass over to the other side. So it was at the command of Jesus that they began the journey. And that's a crucial lesson for us today as we face the storms of life. The question is, is Jesus in your boat? Jesus was in their boat. And that meant that whatever they were going to face, Jesus was going to be there with them. And I want to ask you today to invite Jesus into the boat of your life, into the boat of your career. Invite Jesus into the boat of your family. With Jesus in your boat, safety is assured. That's lesson number two. Number three lesson, they had to send away the multitude before they could move with Jesus. That's a big lesson, friends. The multitude was pressing on Jesus, pressing on them, and Jesus had a short time to be with them on earth. So before they could have time with Jesus, they had to send away the multitude. What is your multitude? It could be anything that takes the time you need to have with God. It could be your job. It could be your education. It could be anything. The disciples had to take away the multitude before they could be with Jesus. And today we are called to take away every impediment that may come in between us and God. And as I, as I end this morning, remember, the Christian life is not a bed of roses. Jesus was in that boat, yet the storms came. And people are asking, where is God when these things happen on earth? Jesus was in the boat. Friends, Jesus was in the boat. Jesus was silent, but he was present. Sometimes in our lives, it may seem that God is, is absent. But God is never absent in our lives. God is always there. Maybe quiet for a moment. Maybe so we can call on him. When they called on Jesus, he arose and he, he calmed the storm. If your Jesus is asleep, it is time for you to call on him, friends. Because when they called on him, Jesus arose and he, he calmed the storm. Jesus never promised a smooth sailing, but he promised a safe landing. Amen.
You need to know what he promised so you can know how to pray well. Jesus never said that you will be loved, but he said that God loves you. He never said that you won't be tempted, but he said he will comfort you when you are tempted. He never said that you won't cry, but he said that one day he will wipe away all tears from our eyes. He never said that you won't be homeless sometimes, like the refugees, refugees from, you know, from the Western countries. He never said that you won't, you won't be homeless, but he said that one day you will have a mansion in heaven. He never even said that you won't get hungry, but he said your bread and your water will be sure. Jesus never said that you won't die, but he said that one day the dead in Christ shall rise again. Amen. This is the Christian's hope. This is our anchor. That even though the boat of our lives may be filling with water, it will never sink. The Bible says the boat was sinking, but it was still afloat. No matter how far, no matter how deep, no matter how bad, God will find a way to rescue you. So this, this morning, I want to ask you a question. Are you ready? To invite Jesus into the boat of your life. Now let me end by saying this. I believe that Jesus will come again. Do you believe that too? Of course, I believe in it. That he will come again. The signs are everywhere that Jesus will come again. But let me tell you what I don't believe. I do not believe that Jesus is waiting for one more earthquake before he will come. I do not believe that he's waiting for one more pandemic before he will come. Sometimes we want to paint a picture of a God who enjoys our misery. No! But I believe that Jesus is waiting for a church and a people that are ready for him. That's my belief. And more especially, in line with our message today, he is waiting for you to invite him into the boat of your life. If that's your pledge today, that you are inviting Jesus into the boat of your life, would you pray with me? Dear Father, Thank you for everything. Thank you for the storms in our lives. If there were no storms, perhaps we wouldn't even know that you were great enough to save us. We have been assured that with you in the boat of our life, we will get safely to our destination. And today, we stand before you, asking you, Father, to come into our boat. Come into the boat of our life. Come into the boat of our career. Come into the boat of our studies, of our education. Come into the boat of our families. Come into the boat of our marriages. Lord, come into our boat. We want to have you on board so that when we are asked, will your anchor hold in the storm of life, we can say confidently, yes, because Jesus is in our boat. Father, we also pray that you come into the boat of those who are sick. Come into the boat of their health and heal them. We pray for peace. We pray for peace, Lord. Hear our prayer today, for we've asked in your name, amen.
thank the preacher so much. Indeed, God is with us in the song. Shall we please take our hymn now and open to hymn number six? Six zero four. Six zero four. Shall we please rise up? Let's all rise up and then. Let us receive a blessing. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort of one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Our last hymn now is taken from 290. 290. Please, let's rise again. <laughs> 